Hi everyone, Mark with CSCA here. This is just a quick note to let you know that due to copyright reasons, we've replaced a couple of the original clips shown at the event with slides and voiceovers. So keep that in mind and enjoy the recording. All right, so what I want to do today, uh, tonight, is uh, introduce you to the new atheism and then uh, identify seven characteristics of the new atheism that relate to uh, my field, the study of science and religion. And I want to uh, suggest that there are a number of distortions and partial truths and even untruths that the new atheists uh, have been presenting uh, in the media. And in short, I'm just getting a little tired of them trashing my discipline of the history of science. Uh, but I want this to be an ironic uh, presentation, and so I will offer an opportunity at the end for some, uh, some reflection. Okay, uh, the term the new atheism was coined in 2005, and it's this issue of Wired magazine that's credited with the coinage. You can see the headline here, the new atheism. No heaven, no hell, just science. So it's very punchy, and it tells you a lot. Uh, the idea is that religion is bunk, and they want to occupy for themselves the territory of science, right? Inside the crusade against religion. So that, I think, says a lot. A number of texts came out just before this publication and mostly after. I'll, I'll just take you through some of those. Sam Harris's The End of Faith, Sam Harris's Letter to a Christian Nation, Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape, the, How Science Can Determine Moral Values. And this speaks to the imperialistic nature of the new atheism, that they want to take over philosophy, ethics, and territory traditionally occupied by religion, human values. Uh, this title the War of the Worldviews, Science versus Spirituality, is typical of the, the conflict metaphor that we'll talk about in a few moments. Obviously, this helps sell books, but it doesn't necessarily speak to the nuances of the relationship between science and religion. Philosopher Daniel Dennett breaking the spell, treating religion as a natural phenomenon. Christopher Hitchens, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, he was one of the most... Uh, 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 most dominant of the new atheists. Notice the title, God with a small g, is not great. How religion poisons everything. And he was criticized even from some fellow atheists for that word, everything. That maybe that, that is what the British would say is a, a little bit over the top. This is the most well-known of the new atheists, Richard Dawkins, and his book, The God Delusion, which came out in 2006. As with the Hitchens book, this became a bestseller. Again, the title says it all, The God Delusion. The, that belief in God is a delusion. Uh, so these four men uh, were called the Four Horsemen, as in the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, in this case, the Four Horsemen of the New Atheism. They all look quite serious. Uh, there is arguably a second tier to the New Atheist movement, and if that is the case, then we could argue that people like David Mills would fit into that category. Atheist universe, the thinking person's answer to Christian fundamentalism. So the idea here is that a thinking person is not going to be a Christian fundamentalist. But actually, if you read the book, uh, re really what he's saying is that a thinking person won't be a believer at all. Notice, by the way, the endorsement from Richard Dawkins, who says it's an admirable work, and also forward by Carl Sagan's son, Dorian Sagan. We're going to uh, return to this book in a few moments. Uh, the late physicist Vich Victor Stenger, God, the failed hypothesis, how science shows that God does not exist. And this speaks to one of the dominant themes of the New Atheist Movement, and that is that science disproves the existence of God. Science disproves the validity of religion. And then Lawrence Krauss, a physicist from Arizona, why there is something rather than nothing, a universe from nothing. And we will return to his work as well. Uh, this expression, why, or this question, why there is something rather than nothing, is actually originally a theological uh, question. It was posed by the German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz in the early 18th century. And this speaks to another aspect of the New Atheist movement, and that is uh, taking over religious categories, religious concepts, religious questions, and secularizing them. 
A.C. Grayling, a British philosopher, uh, he's often in the media. He has a very, very posh and very seductive British accent. And I believe, and maybe this is my bias as someone from North America, that if you hear someone with that kind of posh public school British accent, it, uh, in your mind, their IQ goes up about 20 or 30 points. <laughs> the case against Religion and for humanism. Uh, new atheists often ally themselves with secular humanism. This is secular humanism, not the humanism of the Renaissance. And this one, Jerry A. Coyne's Faith versus Facts. So Jerry Coyne, a now retired biologist at the University of Chicago, once again, uh, headline, Faith versus Fact, very black and white, right? There's no nuance here. It's faith or fact. You can't have both. Why science and religion are incompatible. And then uh, this kind of visual mean, the atheist A with uh, the model of the atom. And this speaks to, again, this attempt to take the ground of science and say that science and atheism are the same thing. This one using the Intel logo, atheism inside, powered by logic and reason. Right? So atheism is associated with logic and reason. The implication is that uh, religion, including Christianity, are not. Richard, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, again, taking that territory for themselves. In addition to the New Atheist Movement, there have been some scientists who, although they don't identify or not attempting to identify with the New Atheist Movement, have spoken atheistically. And one example of this would be uh, Stephen Hawking, along with his co-author Leonard Mladenov, The Grand Design. And by the way, this is another example of the use of traditionally religious language, in this case the design argument, uh, but in a hollowed out, uh, secularized kind of way. Let's consider a statement Hawking made in a documentary that was released after the publication of the book. So when people ask me if a god created the universe, I tell them that the question itself makes no sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there is no time for God to make the universe in. It's like asking for directions to the edge of the Earth. The Earth is a sphere. It doesn't have an edge. So looking for it is a futile exercise. We are each free to believe what we want. And it's my view that the simplest explanation is, there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven and no afterlife either. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe. And for that, I am extremely grateful. So what I find interesting about this as a historian of science is that Hawking is presented in the media as an expert on questions of theology. And it, it raises an interesting question, and that is, does Hawking have any more insights into the existence of God than someone from another field, a carpenter, uh, for example? I think what we're seeing here is a very uh, common question uh, cultural dynamic, and that is that the scientist is often seen in uh, society today as a universal expert. Right? And this certainly helps explain why Richard Dawkins has been able to uh, receive so much uh, coverage in the media. And his book, The God Delusion, is found uh, not only in the science section of bookstores, but also in theology uh, uh, sections. And this is interesting because Dawkins has said he doesn't have to study Christianity because he already knows that it's wrong. And yet, uh, he's taken seriously by um, some people on this subject. This headline right here also speaks to the conflict metaphor, God versus science, even though when you look at the subtitle, it's a spirited debate between atheist Richard Dawkins and Christian geneticist Francis Collins, suggesting that actually you can have God and science. One thing that we have seen with the New Atheist Movement is a series of publications that have responded to their arguments, and some of these publications are works, I think, of, of high literature. 
Uh, Alistair McGrath, with his wife Joanna Collicott McGrath, has published have published the God, sorry, the Dawkins delusion, atheist fundamentalism, and the denial of the divine. And note the endorsement from Michael Ruse, who is a historian of philosopher of science. I know him; he's in my field, uh, but also an atheist. The God delusion makes me embarrassed to be an atheist, and the McGraths show me why. And so I want to stress that this evening I'm actually not speaking directly about atheism. Uh, I'm not speaking about moderate atheists. I'm speaking particularly about this phenomena, the new atheist movement. And people like Michael Ruse, who again are both historians of science and uh, atheists, will actually agree with most, if not everything, of what I am saying uh, this evening. Peter Hitchens, the younger brother of Christopher Hitchens, became an atheist like his brother, but he returned to faith. He is today an Anglican, how atheism led me to faith. Two brothers, two beliefs, two revolted, one returned. And then this book, Why Science Does Not Disprove God. So critiquing the new atheist argument that science points directly away from God. How about this one? An atheist defends religion. Why humanity is better off with religion than without it. We'll come back to that work in a few moments. All right, so this is a list of my seven categories, my seven characteristics of the new atheist movement. Number one, the attack on religion, and by the way, also philosophy. Number two, the conflict thesis, I've already introduced that, and as a, a kind of a subset of that, the myth of the medieval gap. I'll explain what that means in a few moments. The intolerance shown by the new atheists, their tendency to reductionist and essentialistic arguments, scientism, which is a fundamentalistic form of science that they generally advocate, and scientific pantheism and the god of the physicists. So this relates to what I said earlier. They tend to take uh, some of the ground of religion, hollow out the religious meaning, and uh, secularize it. So let's start with the attack on religion and uh, philosophy. Some of you may remember a few years ago in the UK there was the so-called Bendy Bus campaign, the atheist uh, bus campaign. It did spread to North America. Some jurisdictions, many jurisdictions had variations of these ads. So there you see Richard Dawkins with uh, Ariane Shireen who was uh, one of the leaders of this campaign in the UK. This isn't a bendy bus, it's a double-decker bus, but they were put on various kinds of buses. There's probably no God, and it says probably because the Advertising Commission told them they couldn't say there's no God because you can't prove that. Uh, so that's why it says probably. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. The implication here is that if you're religious, you're going to be suffering from anxiety, etc. There's probably no God. Don't let religion divide us. Let's enjoy life together. These, of course, are sound bites, uh, but uh, they are distortions. And they are arguably kind of hypocritical because the new atheist movement themselves tend to be very um, divisive, dividing the world up into us and them, right? The good, who are the atheists, and the bad, who are uh, religious uh, people. Uh, this particular ad right here was uh, shown in Calgary, Alberta. Praying won't help, doing will. And this, this is uh, typical of the kind of dichotomous thinking that you see in the, the New Atheist, some of their writing. So there's no thought here that you can have um, prayer and action, right? It's either or. Uh, so that is obviously a distortion. And this from New York City. Who needs Christ? Nobody, right? Who needs Christ during Christmas? And you may be interested to know, some of you may have heard about this, uh, Richard Dawkins and some other new atheists uh, a few years back, I think it's kind of died down, uh, wanted to turn Christmas into Newtonmas. Because Isaac Newton, after all, was born on December 25th. Uh, this is highly um, ironic because Newton himself was not only very religious, but he was actually a virulent anti atheist. So, probably not the best mascot for the new atheist movement. But again, taking something that's religious and, and kind of, in an imperialistic way, uh, taking uh, the ground. So this is the book uh, where the atheist defends uh, religion. So this question about the association between religion and worry 
the atheists are trying to, the new atheists are trying to save religious people from some of the problems of religion. This is what this atheist says about that. Extensive empirical research has shown that re religious affiliation of almost any kind is positively correlated with better mental health, measures of life satisfaction, and pro-social behaviors, which in turn are associated with enhanced physical well-being and healthy lifestyle practices, which are further related to enhanced quality of life and extended longevity. I want to stress that these aren't in themselves arguments for the existence of God. It's just that they contradict the message that the new atheists are presenting. Militant atheists, and he doesn't call himself a militant atheist, it seems are always claiming that they want to save people from the effects of religion. But save people from what exactly? Why would they want to save people from the enhanced fulfillment, gratitude, optimism, health, and happiness that research proves religion helps foster? And you can find uh, all kinds of examples of this if you look in medical literature, for example. So. Percentage of people reporting themselves very happy, positively correlated to religion attendance. And we know that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation, but these correlations are interesting nevertheless. Uh, religious attendance and marital status. Religion, spirituality, and physical health in cancer patients, positive effect of religion. Same thing in this uh, study and in this one as well. Social participation and depression in old age benefits, again, from religion. Association of religious attendance, religious service attendance with mortality among women. Here are the findings. Frequent attendance at religious services was associated with significantly lower risk of all-cause cardiovascular and cancer mortality among women. Religion and spirituality may be an underappreciated resource that phys physicians could explore with their patients as appropriate. So the very science that the new atheists like to associate themselves with uh, speaks a, a rather different message than what they imply. Uh, here's another aspect of the attack on religion, the argument that all religion basically reduces to fanaticism. Right. So um, someone who's a moderate religious person, uh, they will either argue that at, at uh, the fundamental level they are actually fanatics, or they'll say they're not really religious. Right. And these kind of straw men arguments that they set up. So Francis Collins, an evangelical Christian who is a, a leading geneticist in the U.S., the caricature of faith that Dawkins presents is easy for him to attack, but it is not the real thing. As you know, it's easier to take down a straw man argument than the real thing. So an example of this is the is atheism's definition of faith. Here's Dawkins. Faith means blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. Uh, this is a, a definition of faith that clearly uh, doesn't come from a religious person. It's a caricature that's foisted on the religious person. And uh, I don't think religious people are grateful for this. So, faith is belief in the complete absence of evidence. This is the argument that Dawkins is presenting. And in contrast to that, science is completely about facts. If you talk to pretty much any philosopher, sociologist of science, uh, they would say, whether they're religious or not, they would say, this actually is not true. Faith is unquestioning belief, right? And someone who makes that kind of claim has never encountered some sophisticated theological traditions which actually uh, use uh, questioning and even uh, methodological doubt. Faith is belief in the absence of complete evidence. I think that that is a definition that uh, Christians certainly uh, would find themselves much happier to accept. You could even argue that there's a kind of continuum from uh, blind faith, faith with no evidence, faith with partial evidence, a kind of informed faith, and no belief without evidence, which philosophers of science refer to as positivism. The one of the bi biblical definitions of faith is found in Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The faith bridges the gap, the lack, uh, the gap in the evidence. Another uh, specific example that relates to the Christian faith is the resurrection of Christ. So generally speaking, the argument would be that we do have some testimonies in the gospel account. We do have some. Uh, indirect evidence, 
but we don't have no evidence for the resurrection of Christ. We're not, we weren't there, we didn't see it, so we don't have all the evidence, but we have some evidence, and the faith uh, bridges the gap. So that is a definition, I think, that most Christians would be much more uh, comfortable with. Our second category is uh, the conflict thesis. Uh, this thesis emerges in the in Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment in particular in the 18th century, but it's really canonized by two works that are published near the end of the 19th century. So John William Draper's History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. Note in the title that word conflict, and this is where we get the expression, the conflict thesis. And then Andrew Dixon White's book, which is slightly more nuanced, A History of the Warfare of Science with theology in Christendom. So that Christendom uh, helps uh, suggest that what White is really targeting is institutional forms of Christianity. And so there's a little bit more nuance there, but nevertheless, this warfare metaphor comes out even in the uh, headline terms of the title. And to this day, these, these works are uh, regularly uh, cited, and some of the quotations from these works regularly appear on the internet, even though very few historians of science today would accept their findings because they're very selective. They're examples of what we would call confirmation bias, and uh, the history is extremely uh, distorted and shoddy. Here's a, a more recent example of the conflict thesis from the aforementioned Jerry Coyne. Science and religion are competitors in the business of finding out what is true about our universe. So here's a competition model. In this goal, religion has failed miserably, for its tools for discerning truth are useless. These areas are incompatible in precisely the same way and in the same sense that rationality is incompatible with irrationality. Implication here is that science is associated with rationality, religion with irrationality. But it's interesting that Coyne seems to be saying that science and religion are competitors in the field of science. That's essentially what he's saying. So religion loses out. We'll encounter a similar claim made by Stephen Hawking a little bit later. Fortunately, there's some very good historical works that critique and answer these uh, conflict-related metaphors. So there is the dominant overarching conflict thesis, but then there are various uh, sub-theses or examples like the myth that Galileo went to jail. He wasn't sent to jail. He was put under house arrest, and there's a lot of... Uh, uh, detail in his account that you really need to understand in order to have an assessment of uh, what actually happened when Galileo had his trial with the church. There are a number of other uh, myths that are uh, debunked or critiqued in this book, including the myth of the medieval gap, which we will get to in uh, a few uh, moments. All right, so now we will return to Stephen Hawking. In 2010, as part of a publicity drive for the book The Grand Design, Hawking was interviewed by Diane Sawyer of ABC News. Now, bear in mind that in later years, when Hawking was interviewed, uh, the questions had to be given to him in advance, and he entered his responses into his speech synthesizer. Okay, with that backdrop in mind, let's look at a, a brief exchange from that interview. Sawyer asked, and it doesn't seem to make you sad ever that we are so insignificant in the universe. And Hawking's reply, which doesn't exactly seem to answer the question, is as follows. There is a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which is based on observation and reason. Science will win because it works. So. Again, what we're seeing here is the argument that when competing for the turf that science holds, the study of nature, religion won't win. Well, of course it won't. Religion is not designed to do the things that science does. It's like saying if science and religion are competing for the turf that religion holds, science will, will lose and religion will win. It's a really simplistic uh, argument, but it's typical of this kind of imperialistic thinking that we've identified. 
Our third characteristic is the myth of the medieval gap. The historian of science Peter Harrison, who's based in Australia, has just published a book, 2015, called The Territories of Science and Religion, and he identifies this myth in this book. The history of science, and one very common understanding, has three distinct stages. Science is said to have had its origins in Greek antiquity when philosophers first broke away from the myths of their forebears and sought rational explanations for natural phenomena. Phenomena. Science subsequently suffered a setback with the advent of Christianity, going into significant decline in the Middle Ages, but then emerged triumphant with the scientific revolution of the 17th century when it finally broke away from religion and set out on its progressive path to the present. So Carl Sagan, in his magisterial science documentary from 1980, 13-episode uh, science documentary, uh, the book of the same title, uh, published in the same year, which is essentially a transcript of that documentary. I use this documentary in a course I teach on science and the media because I think it's one of the best science documentaries ever produced. Unfortunately, although the science is pretty good, sometimes the history uh, is incorrect and distorted. And medieval historians in particular often talk about the 1,000-year white space in the history of science found on page 335 of the cosmos. So what you see here is an event, supposed event, the destruction of the Alexandrian Library, which is thought to have taken place at the same time as the death of Hypatia, which was 415 AD. In fact, the Alexandrian Library uh, already had been destroyed and fallen into disrepair by that point. And then this argument that this brings on the Dark Ages and then nothing for a thousand years in the history of science and technology until Columbus and Leonardo. Leonardo is there, even though he has no influence on the history of science, because no one knew about his scientific and technological work. It was only in manuscript. He does have, of course, an impact in the history of art. The millennium gap in the middle of the diagram represents a poignant lost opportunity for the human species. My friends, the lost opportunity is to do good history. If Sagan is correct, then parts of courses that my program teaches are much ado about nothing. We have courses that deal with medieval science. An entire term, in, in, in one case in my department, deals with uh, this subject. So, uh, this is a myth. The film Agora, which is about Hypatia, uh, extends this myth. She's presented as an atheist. She wasn't an atheist. She was a Neoplatonist, which means she was virtually uh, a monotheist. The, um, the mob uh, who kills her, historically, yes, it was Christians who killed her, but for political reasons. They're dressed as if they're the Taliban, with dark clothes, dark turbans, and that sort of thing. And the thought is, is if you want to criticize the Taliban, why don't you deal with the Taliban and not uh, portray early Christians as if they were the Taliban? And it gets worse. Uh, you, find, you can find these kind of charts online. So the argument here is that science is going along really well until Christianity comes along, and then it tanks and flatlines for about a thousand years. Just think about it. We could have been exploring the galaxy by now. And this one right here, which does the same thing, and then projects that there's going to be uh, a Muslim dark age in uh, the future. And here again, we have this uh, basically a millennium gap. Dark Ages, Crusades, Inquisition, Wars of Religion, Witch Trials, notice, the, notice that it's in red, and notice the demarcation points, Death of Hypatia, and uh, the Inquisition, Giordano Bruno, uh, being burned alive. Now, I mentioned earlier the book by David Mills, Atheist Universe. I'll just read you some quotations from David Mills's work. For 1,500 years, the Christian church systematically operated torture chambers throughout Europe. Torture was the rule, not the exception. Each year, the Christian church in Europe tortured to death tens of thousands of people, including children as young as two years of age. And I don't wish to diminish uh, the deaths that did occur. However, if we calculate based on his statement, the figure, we take as a minimum for every year 20,000. He says tens of thousands, so a minimum would be 20,000 for the 1,500-year period. So he's extended the millennium gap to 1,500 years. Why not add 500 years while you're on a roll? 
And what does this come to? 30 million deaths for that period of 15 Hundred years. Scholarly estimates for the number of accused witches put to death uh, in the entire Middle Ages range from 70, or sorry, 7,000 to 100,000 deaths. This is actually, sorry, the entire Middle Ages and uh, the early modern period. The number of people put to death for heresy in those periods was actually much lower. So it seems that what is going on here is that if you are on the side of the just or the right, you don't actually need to use facts. So, Peter Harrison did a study of the words religio and scientia, which give us the words religion and science, a kind of historical uh, philology, and he showed that there actually really is no thing called religion in the modern sense or science in the modern sense in the ancient world. The ancient Greeks, who are often considered to be proto-scientists, were doing philosophy a practice aimed at the art of living and elevating one's moral virtues. Unlike anything in the modern sciences, the study of physics or natural philosophy was an exercise directed toward the transformation of the self. In the 17th century, it was a common belief that natural philosophy was essentially to do with love of God and of neighbor. What we now call religion was not so much assent to a set of propositions, but similarly focused on morality and living a good life. In other words, the practice of philosophy, including natural philosophy and the life of faith, had similar goals. We must not map onto the past the categories of the present. The medieval gap is based on two basic exaggerations. Number one, the achievements of the Greeks were, are overstated. And number two, the achievements of the medievals are understated. And when we take these together, the myth of the medieval gap seems plausible. And some assumptions as well. Number one, that the study of nature came to a standstill or near standstill for a thousand years or more, as in the case of David Mills. That there was something like science in classical antiquity that was lost with the rise of Christianity. That there was, a, that there is an essential antagonism between science and religion. We're going to speak about essentialism in a few moments. That tension between science and religion is necessarily bad, and necessarily bad for science, and that science and technology are necessarily and always a force for good. Some overlooked details. The classical Greeks produced a number of erroneous ideas about nature that led to dead ends. For example, some forms of classical Greek philosophy of nature, particularly Aristotelianism, arguably restricted and limited the medieval understanding of nature. Classical philosophy of nature was already in decline when Christianity came into prominence. So uh, that uh, makes very problematic those charts that I showed you earlier. And then we have the innovation within Islamic civilization, much of which spread to Europe. The technology of China, some of which spread to Europe. Uh, the compass and gunpowder, for example. Yes, these things don't come from within Europe, but they help show that by the end of the Middle Ages, science and technology in Christian Europe was far in advance of anything or at any time in the classical periods. And proponents of the medieval gap demonstrate a severe form of myopia because the early modern period, when finally, uh, when science finally did emerge, was arguably even more Christian than the Middle Ages. So the argument doesn't work on that level as well. Now, as with many of these myths, there is often a grain of truth. There certainly is a grain of truth in the case of the medieval gap. So it's true that the first half of the Middle Ages saw fewer and less significant innovations in science and technology than the second half, but this is also true of the early modern period and the modern period and pretty much any period that you can find in the history of science. It can also be partly explained by certain geopolitical political events, such as, has anyone heard of the barbarian invasions and the various visitations of the plague? The slower growth in science and technology during the early middle, middle uh, medieval period should not be taken as normative for the entire Middle Ages. Fortunately, we have a number of very good works by historians that fill out uh, in great detail the scientific and technological achievements of the Middle Ages. Now, I'm not going to claim that science emerges in the Middle Ages because most historians of science, myself included, would argue that it emerges fully in the early modern period. However, the foundations, many of them, are laid 
in the Middle Ages. So, uh, James Hannon's God's Philosophers, The Abacus and the Cross, and uh, this book by Jeffrey Wigglesworth, who's at Red Deer College. He did a postdoc with me, Science and Technology in Medieval European Life. According to some people, books like this shouldn't exist, but they do exist, and these studies have been produced by scholars who are Christians, by scholars who are not Christians. They're just doing a good history. A number of inventions of the Middle Ages. One of the problems with the medieval gap is it tends to neglect technology. Universities, this isn't technology, it's a kind of social technology, one could argue. Uh, they're founded in the 11th century. They taught mathematics, astronomy, and natural philosophy. We have Arabic, which ultimately are Indian or Hindu numerals, introduced. Zero, it's a major uh, introduction to Europe in 1202. Uh, was, they were used a little bit earlier than that, but the major introduction is 1202 by Leonardo Fibonacci, who gives us the Fibonacci sequence. Paper from re recycled rags, the compass from the east, water mills, they were known to Romans, but they were only used by them a little bit, and windmills, eyeglasses, which lead eventually to telescopes and the microscope, like the mechanical escapement clock, buttons, trousers, the fork, the rudder, gunpowder, again from the east, and printing with, the, with movable type. This is technically a medieval invention because normally we would think of the Middle Ages ending around the year uh, 1500. Okay, another quotation from David Mills. 1500, sorry, yes, 1500, 1500 years of progress were therefore stifled by the Christian church. Were it not for religious persecution and oppression of science, mankind might have landed on the moon in the year AD 650. <laughs> Cancer may have been eradicated forever by the year AD 800, and heart disease may today be unknown, but Christianity put into deep hibernation Greek and Egyptian scientific gains of the past. Well, I put it to you, this is simply rubbish. There's no thought here for historical contingency, that certain developments have to happen before other developments happen. And what I find interesting about this is that Dawkins produces an endorsement for the book, as we mentioned earlier. I'm assuming that if this book had any scientific errors, that Dawkins would have had some trouble putting that endorsement on, although Dawkins is a biologist, so maybe if there are errors in the physics, he might not have noticed. But for some reason, historical errors get a pass. Uh, I don't understand this. It breaks my heart as a historian, uh, but uh, this seems to be uh, the case all too often with these books. Part of this argument is based on the idea that religion is inexorable, in inexorable retreat before science. And related to this, you have the idea of the God of the Gaps. As you can see in this Sidney Harris uh, cartoon here, I think you should be more explicit here in step two than a miracle occurs. So what is the God of the Gaps? Well, the God of the Gaps critique actually comes from within Christianity. So a Christian scientist, that is to say a Christian who was a scientist, not a Christian scientist in the denominational sense, when we come to the scientifically unknown, our correct policy is not to rejoice because we have found God, it is to become better scientists. There is no God of the gaps to take over at those strategic places where science fails. And the reason is that gaps of this sort have the unpreventable habit of shrinking. When Descartes located the soul in the pineal gland, all was well until the real purpose of the pineal gland was discovered. Then there was no room for the soul, and people began to doubt whether there really was such a thing. And John Polkinghorne has also spoken about this. The trend is to look for God in dramatic discontinuities in physics or biology, and if none are found, to declare religion vanquished. But God may act in subtle ways that are hidden from physical science. So this, this critique is shared by many Christians who work in the sciences, that if you, if you can't find an answer to something using science or by studying nature, you put God in that gap. So this has been identified as a problem uh, from uh, within uh, Christianity as well. And so a, a more subtle theology is to argue that God is, is at work, that God's providence is there all along, but you also always have a physical explanation, and that's what science studies. Intolerance. Okay, let's look at some examples of this. This is Francis Collins, who is... Uh, was the head of one of the two human genome projects, which 
uh, culminated in the announcement, the publication of the human genome in the year 2000. Uh, he was appointed a few years back as the director of the NIH, which effectively makes him the top scientist in the United States. He is also an evangelical Christian, and I should add, uh, he can play the guitar. <laughs> so when he was appointed, uh, Sam Harris and a few other uh, new atheists uh, protested. They said, we're not really sure that someone like him, who's an evangelical Christian, who is superstitious, uh, should be uh, put in such an authoritative position. Not, is he a good scientist and does he have a good track record as a scientific manager? And the answer to the, both those questions is a resounding uh, yes. So this points to a troubling intolerance that maybe there should be a religious test for entry into the science, sciences. This is one reason why Christians often self-select against going into the sciences, that they feel that there is going to be this hostility. All right. Now some audience participation. What is the first book of the New Testament? There's a reason why I'm asking this question. Matthew, you're right. First book of the New Testament. What is the full title of Darwin's famous book on evolution? Does anyone know the full title? 1859. On the Origin of Species. That's one quarter of the title. <laughs> anyone? Does anyone know? Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Uh, let me tell you why I'm asking these questions. A few years back in England, uh, Richard Dawkins did a survey of people in Britain who had signed their uh, census uh, with the name Christian, that they, they were identifying as a Christian. So he surveyed some of these people, and one of the questions he asked them was, what's the first book in the New Testament? And a surprisingly low number of those people who said they were Christian could identify uh, Matthew as that book. And then he suggests, well, these people aren't really Christians. So he went on and was interviewed with uh, the Anglican uh, minister, uh, Giles Fraser. And let's listen to what themselves happened. as Christian. You you know what they are, even even though they tell you. I'm, I'm not I'm not presenting my opinion here. This press release is offered to people to look down it and say, look, these people who who call themselves Christians actually don't read the Bible, don't go to church, don't believe Jesus was the Son of God, don't even know what the first book of the New Testament is. But, but Richard, it's up I, to I... you to make up your mind whether you think they're Christian. Don't ask me. My opinion is not relevant. Richard, if I if I said to you, what is the full time? of the origin of species. I'm sure you could tell me that. Yes, I could. Go on then. On the origin of species, uh, with, oh God, uh, <laughs> on the origin of species, um, there, there is a subtitle the, uh, um, with respect to the, pre the preservation of favoured races in the fight, in the struggle. For You're life. the high oh, pope of Darwinism. Not bad, and, and I'm you, giving you, you some justice. But, I mean, but if you are... <laughs> <laughs> so... If there is a moral, it is if you're on live radio and you're asked, can you uh, give a title of a book and you can't do it, don't say yes. Now, I'm not, I'm not attempting here to poke fun at Richard Dawkins. I'm just pointing to this, this intolerance that is characteristic of the New Atheism. So there you have it, the first book from the King James Bible of the New Testament and the full title of The Origin of Species. It has four components. On the Origin of Species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. All right, so many people who have studied the New Atheist movement from a humanities perspective have pointed to the fact that the New Atheist and humanist worldview tends to be white, male, bourgeois, Eurocentric, tied to European Enlightenment values. A lot of feminist uh, critics have pointed this out, and in favor of a homogeneous uh, culture. And one thing that we see in the New Atheist movement is that they're not committed to pluralism. They're not committed to uh, metaphysical or uh, religious pluralism in a society. They want to see a society that's made in their own uh, image. And along with this, a certain reputation for arrogance has uh, developed. And uh, this quotation from uh, Stephen Colbert uh, speaks to that. But this uh, idea actually goes back to the late Victorian period. So here we see from the Punch magazine uh, 
A caricature, the dangers of dogmatism. Brown, a mild agnostic, in reply to Smith, a rabid evolutionist who has been asserting the doctrines of his school with unnecessary violence, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I've had several of my non-religious colleagues say that they're almost pushed into Christianity by the arrogance and the extreme arguments of the new atheists. And I want to just suggest that rather than be overly critical of the new atheists for this, that we reflect a little bit on ways in which uh, we, if we're not atheists, uh, can do uh, similar things. Um, I, I have just a couple more uh, quotations under the heading of intolerance. So a title, the title of an opinion piece by Lawrence Krauss, published in the New Yorker, 8th of September, 2015, all scientists should be militant atheists. Uh, a title of a talk given by biologist and blogger P. Z. Myers, sorry, he's American, P. Z. Myers. <laughs> Scientists, if you're not an atheist, you aren't doing science right. So this intolerance is, one again, one of the reasons why some Christians uh, think twice about going into the sciences, because they feel that they're going to uh, experience this kind of intolerance and hostility. Reductionism and essentialism. Okay, I'll give you some examples of this. A uh, couple visual memes that you can find on the internet. Science flies you to the moon, religion into skyscrapers. So it's very black and white thinking here. There's no, obviously, no nuance here. Now, uh, clearly the reference in the bottom part is to uh, the horrific events of 9-11. And in fact, historically we know, and this has been stated by uh, several new atheists, including Richard Dawkins, that the events of 9-11 uh, were a watershed uh, moment for the incipient movement, because it was at that point that some of them thought, or at least they claimed to have thought, that uh, religion really was virulent and needed to be uh, stamped out. Now, all, obviously, many people have studied the events of 9-11 and have argued that religion may not have been the most dominant uh, factor, that the more dominant factor uh, may have been political. But again, these visual sound bites don't uh, speak uh, to those kinds of nuances. A similar one here. Religion gave us the dark ages. Science gave us the space age. What we're seeing here is the excluded middle, that you can have religion and science. As a matter of fact, that very picture was taken, some of you may know, by the Apollo 8 mission, the first time that humans orbited the moon. There you have the three uh, astronauts, including uh, Jim Lovell in the middle, who was also in Apollo 13. The picture was actually taken in this orientation. We tend to flip it around because we think of the analogy of the Earth. Does anyone know what text was read during that famous mission on Christmas Eve 1968 on live television? Does anyone know? Genesis chapter 1, and this Apollo 8 stamp commemorates that. And by the way, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, a very vocal atheist uh, at the time, uh, protested that this uh, public mission with public funds had used religion. There was supposed to be separation of religion uh, and the state in, in the U.S. And uh, the response of the men on the mission was that this is just a text that is a kind of a common heritage of humanity. Now, because of that, when the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon, and Buzz Aldrin, who you see here, most of the pictures of the first mission on the moon are of Buzz Aldrin because Neil Armstrong had the camera. Uh, he was a he is a Presbyterian, he's still alive, and he wanted to take communion on the moon, so he did so, but he hushed it up, and no one knew about it until later. By the way, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, uh, very uh, prominent atheist, she's one of the ones who got uh, prayer out of the U.S. school system. Uh, she had a son, she has a son, um, how do you rebel against an atheist parent? He became a born-again Christian. Rational reconstructionism. This is a form of essentialism. For example, and you see this quite a bit, the idea that, say, Aristotle was a scientist. Well, he wasn't a scientist. This isn't mere pedantry. This isn't... Uh, uh, a technicality. He was not a scientist. He could not have been a scientist. He was a philosopher. The term scientist wasn't even coined until 1833. Uh, so the idea that there is this thing, this role called the scientist that continues right back in time, more or less unchanged, uh, doesn't bear scrutiny. In fact, as Peter Harrison has argued, the idea of founders on, on 
the fact that much of the philosophizing about nature and the cosmos in, in the classical period was far from materialistic. The pre-Socratic philosopher Thales declared that all things are full of gods. It was an exagoras as belief that the whole universe was controlled by a divine causal principle, nous, that's the Greek word for mind or intellect. This belief was to influence in various ways Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, and the Neoplatonists, and which came to underpin much of the subsequent ancient Greek belief in the inherent rationality of the natural world. More than that, in various ways, other pre-Socratic philosophers had postulated similar principles, Anax Anaximander's Aperon, Heraclitus's Logos, Xenophanes, one God, that imply an ordered yet divinely animated cosmos. Here's a statement, a very clear statement of scientific reductionism from Peter Atkins, an atheist, retired chemist from the University of Oxford. Reductionist science is omnicompetent. Have you heard that word before? Omnicompetent. Science has never encountered a barrier it is not surmounted, or that can at least reasonably suppose it has the power to surmount and will in due course be equipped to do so. There is no explicitly demonstrated validity in the view that there are aspects of the universe closed to science. Response to this thinking comes from George Ellis, who co-wrote a book on the structure of space-time with Stephen Hawking. Some writers claim that there can be no limits to what science can do. They are either ignorant or having you on. Given the boundaries science has already overcome, one might easily get the impression that it will find no limits in the future. This idea is wrong. As our understanding of the universe develops, so does our understanding of the limits on which science will ever be able to do. We know gravity exists, we can describe its effects, but we cannot tell you why it works. What we can do is observe it in action and describe that action ever more accurately. We do not know how God or nature makes matter obey those rules. Science can tell you what laws the laws of physics are, but it cannot tell you why they exist. Science cannot tell you why the universe exists, and above all, it cannot tell you whether or not God exists. These limitations cannot be changed by future advances in science. They are fundamental to its nature. Science forms a valuable part of human life, but it is not the basis for the whole a whole human life. We shall always need to study and teach ethics, ascetics, and philosophy as well as science. And this should include comparative religion if you want a whole human being. Those who claim science will supplant any or all of them are indulging in a little fantasy. Be kind to them, but don't take them seriously. <laughs> George Ellis, uh, a leading uh, cosmologist uh, based in, uh, the, in South Africa, also a, a Quaker and a Christian. All right, scientism. So we're down to two more, uh, two final, or two final categories. Uh, Stenmark, in his book Scientism from 2001, has identified four scientific theses. The only kind of knowledge we can have is scientific knowledge, thesis one. The only things that exist are the ones science can discover, thesis two. Science alone can answer our moral questions and explain as well as replace traditional ethics, thesis three. Science alone can answer our existential questions and explain as well as replace traditional religion. So this is a form of uh, scientific fundamentalism. Uh, it's also a form of imperialism, suggesting that science can take over all other <laughs> disciplines. Traditionally, and still to this day, scientists adopt in their work methodological naturalism. And effectively, what this means is that when you're in the laboratory, whether you're a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, uh, an agnostic, uh, an atheist, everyone agrees that you're studying nature. And the reflections on the metaphysical aspects, if there are some, happen in the synagogue or the mosque or the atheist union uh, or in publications associated with those uh, traditions. But they don't appear in scientific publications. You don't see this. Since the, the 19th century, the late 19th century, you don't uh, see this. But for the new atheists, meta methodological naturalism elides with metaphysical naturalism. This is the idea that nature is all that there is, not just that when we're studying nature, we just study nature. Uh, so this is actually a metaphysical uh, position. And it's contrasted, of course, with metaphysical supernaturalism, that there is a transcendent realm, a god, etc. So, scientism from a sociological perspective, if science is a replacement religion for the secular age, then scientism is its fundamentalism. 
Ian Barber, in his work Religion and Science, has said science is not as objective nor religion as subjective as has been claimed. So one of the arguments is that science is completely objective, it's just about discovering things that are out there, whereas religion is very touchy-feely and subjective. Now, there's more than a grain of truth in that analysis, but it's not a completely uh, black and white situation. So, as I've alluded to already, many sociologists, historians, anthropologists, philosophers of science have pointed out that science has all kinds of subjectivity. So here is an account that points in that direction. The idea that scientific truth is arrived at without feeling or bias based solely upon experimental data has been shown to be a myth. The philosopher of science Michael Poyani has shown that no truth is arrived at without the scientists assuming or having faith in a particular worldview. Accordingly, even in science, there's no such thing as abstract knowledge. It is always knowledge held by someone as commitment. So the faith component, so important in religion, has its counterpart in science. So remember, uh, Peter Atkins, is science really omnicompetent? Is science really all we need? And does the new atheist critique of religion reduce to the argument that religion should be rejected because it does not offer scientific explanations of the world? Remember Stephen Hawking. Science will win because it works. But will win at what? Science will certainly win at science, uh, obviously. Uh, so I think the argument does tend to reduce that way. Now, we could ask this question. What would happen if a critical magnifying glass were focused on science? And I need to preface what I'm going to say next uh, by just stating that I am not anti-science. The reason why I got into history of science is because I, I love science. I, I truly love it. But it's a human endeavor, and it's not perfect. So if we want to criticize science, you can find areas to criticize. Uh, here's a, a very well-known paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. How many scientists fabricate and fabricate and falsify research? The trouble with retractions, the rise of retractions. Why is the number of scientific retractions increased? Undemocracy, inequalities in science. Uh, uh, trainees report harassment and assault, saying no to harassment. Similarly, if one turns a uh, magnifying glass on the New Atheist Movement, one can see, for example, many have pointed out, sexism and misogyny. Brazen sexism is pushing women out of America's atheism movement. Atheism, shocking women problem. What's behind the misogyny of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris? Will misogyny bring down the atheist movement? So the point here is that whatever field you look at, whether it be science, religion, uh, politics, you're going to find all kinds of examples of nastiness and where that uh, uh, discipline has uh, been associated with less desirable outworkings. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that discipline is at its core uh, problematic. But the, the new atheists don't play fair ball. They point to the negative aspects of religion, aspects that many religious people agree are negative, and don't focus on the positive aspects. And they do the reverse uh, with their own worldview. So here's a question. Should science be considered inherently evil because hundreds of millions of people have been killed as a result of science and technology over the past two centuries? You could make that argument. And we could argue that science is a scourge. I have an example to illustrate this point. In 2013, John Stewart had Richard Dawkins on The Daily Show. He asked Dawkins, and I'm paraphrasing here, what is more likely to end civilization, religion or science? Dawkins equivocated and said that it would be a religious fanatic using technology to destroy the world. Stewart, being a good journalist, pressed Dawkins further. Doesn't it, though, let scientists off the hook to some extent to suggest that their work could only be misused by those whose minds are boggled by religious fanaticism, when in fact, isn't there a strong probability that we are not necessarily in control of the unintended consequences of our scientific advancement? I'm not suggesting to ever stop it, but don't you think that it's even possibly more likely that we will create something that the unintended consequence of it is worldwide catastrophe? To that, Dawkins replied candidly, that is possible. And it's something we have to worry about. The precautionary principle, I think, is very important. Science is the most powerful way to do 
whatever it is you want to do. And if you want to do good, it's the most powerful way of doing good. And if you want to do evil, it's the most powerful way to do evil. So that's a, a very useful, frank uh, admission from Richard Dawkins. But uh, it's interesting that he doesn't accord uh, religion the same um, balanced assessment. So religion is a very powerful uh, force in society. It's very, very powerful to do good and very powerful uh, to do uh, evil. Terry Eagleton on Dawkins. On the horrors that science and technology have wrecked on humanity, Dawkins is predictably silence. Uh, now, in this case, he wasn't. Yet, the apocalypse is far more likely to be the product of them than the work of religion. Swapy, the Inquisition, for chemical warfare, and of course, also such things as the atomic bomb. You notice in that clip that Dawkins kind of wants to say, well, technology may provide the means to our destruction, which probably be a religious fanatic who pre presses the button. He just kind of had to sneak that in there. Our final uh, topic, scientific pantheism and the god of the physicists. Uh, what we see here is that materialist scientists borrow and secularize religious ideas, terms, and institutions. We've already been talking about this a little bit. In his uh, documentary, Cosmos, Sagan opens with this line. He's standing on the shore of Cal Northern California. The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. What is the illusion here? Does anyone know? The what text is he? Sorry? The glory of Patri in Christian liturgy. Uh, more immediately, I'm thinking of the uh, slightly earlier text, such as in the New Testament. Nope. There it is. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So there is a kind of uh, implied uh, pantheism, the use of religious language. If you take the word cosmos in his text and replace it with God, it still works grammatically. It's interesting. There's Sagan in his ship of the imagination. It's meant to look like the bridge from Star Trek. Uh, the original series, but it also looks like something else. It looks like the inside of a cathedral, right? So scientists come off as the new priests, and many people who have written about the Sagan's cosmos have pointed out that feature of the documentary. So there's Dawkins, and I want to say something about him, and that is that he has more than once said that he is actually open to the god of the physicists. So he says that in this a uh, particular uh, interview, a transcendent, gigantic intelligence. And then in this interview right here, uh, he says that he's okay with the grand god of the physicists. And the interviewer says when someone like Dawkins leaves the room open for some kind of take on God, you know that all hope isn't lost. And the interesting thing here is that what he's saying is that he's, he's happy with a god sort of made in his own image, a kind of god of the physicists. He doesn't like an intervening god. That's what he doesn't like. By the way, Dawkins has said, uh, that he's actually an agnostic, not an atheist. So it's just that he st leans strongly towards um, atheism. Why is there something rather than nothing? I mentioned this book by Lawrence Krauss. Uh, this question is another example of science sort of catching up to a theological question. The idea of cre uh, Kratio ex nihilo comes out of an apocryphal work, this uh, second Maccabees. It's arguably in the book of Hebrews. As well, you can see where the language uh, ex nihilo comes from in the Latin there. And uh, in uh, Hebrews 1 and 11, we've already, uh, sorry, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, we've already alluded to this, uh, things uh, that are, um, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible, uh, etc. All right, I'm going to summarize now. Successes of uh, the new atheism. Uh, I want to I want to provide a balanced assessment here. They've been very successful in attracting enormous media attention to the cause of atheism. Uh, they benefit from several high-profile, passionate, articulate, intelligent apologists like Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, certainly Richard Dawkins, both with their posh English accents. Uh, number three, skillful at exposing religious extremism, abuses, and hypocrisy, adept at shining spotlights on certain religious teachings and practices that some find incompatible with reason. They've convinced some that science and religion are not compatible. This, of course, is a, a success from their point of view. Has convinced They've convinced some that Secularism is inexorable and associated with progress, and they've helped add vibrancy to debates about faith, reason, and science. Criticisms of the new atheism. They tend to equate religion with fanaticism. They often show bigoted attitudes towards religion. They emphasize abuses of religion, but don't give religion credit for what good it does. 
It is, uh, is often ignorant or ill-informed about theology, or worse, deliberately distorts it. They deploy unsophisticated epistemologies and philosophies of science. They display a positivistic attitude towards science and tend towards scientism. And they use uh, science for apologetic aims. For example, contending that science in general, and Darwinism in particular, point directly to atheism and materialism. And they tend to look like fundamentalists. So here are some elements of fundamentalism, including some stereotypes, intolerance, hostility towards opponents, rejection of pluralism, a Manichaean, black and white view of reality, an unbalanced use of facts, imperialism, dogmatism, closed-mindedness, and triumphalism. Now, what I want to uh, suggest, that, as I conclude, is that the new atheists do not, as they want to argue, have a corner on the market of science. There is the problem of the excluded middle. And here, I will show you my final clip, if I can find it. Can you believe that still today, in learned society and in houses of government, unfortunately, we're still debating and still questioning whether humans have a role in the earth warming up, or whether even the earth is warming up, period that we are still debating and still questioning whether life was a divine intervention or whether it was coming out of a natural process, let alone, oh my goodness, lo and behold, random process. Now, I don't want to get into involved in politics, and I don't really know the intention of that statement, uh, but it can be read as speaking to the excluded middle, that you can have uh, a divine cause and... Uh, a physical cause. So, it is possible to be a fully committed Christian and fully committed to science, right? There's that excluded middle, uh, and we can find many examples of scientists uh, who do this very thing. Francis Collins, Owen Gingrich, a historian of science and also an astronomer, God's universe, God's planet, uh, Alistair McGrath, a fine-tuned universe, the quest for God in science and theology, John Polkinghorne, uh, John Lennox, who's written about God, and Stephen Hawking, and many other uh, books. And then we have the aforementioned George Ellis, who co-wrote this book, this very profound book, which I don't understand, The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time, although there are a few people in this room that do. And there he is uh, lecturing. He's given many lectures, including for CSCA, by the way, in the past on this to topic. Christians played both a central role in the emergence of modern science and through um, abuses helped inspire the new atheist movement. So there's a kind of a paradox here because some of what the new atheists say about Christianity is true because precisely because they're talking often about abuses. So here's uh, an opportunity for some soul searching. Christians who find the arrogance, mockery, dogmatism, stereotyping, lack of fair-mindedness, poor philosophy, and biased history of the new atheists disturbing should look to themselves before casting the first stone because Obviously, Christians can do this too. Don't give the new atheist reasons to slander Christianity or to reject the possibility of the compatibility of science and faith. Engage with science positively and don't self-select against pursuing a career in the sciences. Christians do this. This shouldn't happen. The new atheist uh, movement is a positive opportunity for Christians and for the engagement of faith and science. And for that, we can thank God for the new atheists. I'm done. Well, first of all, thank you for your lecture. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, wonderfully done. Um, I read a book by Richard Starkley called The Victory of Reason. And he has a number of different books that talks about Christianity's role in the development of science through the Middle Ages and whatnot. Um, he tends to focus just on that and doesn't include uh, other faiths and other peoples in the development of science. But I was wondering what your take in, on his uh, approach would be. Yeah, this is uh, Rodney Stark. Yeah, Rodney yeah, he's Stark. Written, yes. He's written a number of books along the same vein. Um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he makes a partial point, uh, but there is a problem, I would argue, in pushing the uh, contention that uh, science emerges from Christianity too far. Uh, so here's one, one aspect of uh, one, one problem that, that um, one could raise, and that is that uh, Christianity is not the only inspiration for modern science. Uh, so for example, the Epicurean tradition in the early modern period surely plays a role in the emergence of atomism, uh, for example. It's revived in the late Renaissance, it's revived again in the, in the Enlightenment, and uh, it is 
certainly not Christian. It's pre-Christian. It's, um, it's non-providentialist. In many respects, is quite different from the Christian worldview. It does share, I think, with the Hebrew Bible, um, a focus on, um, on the material world. I think the, the Hebrew Bible certainly uh, does uh, do that. But there's another problem, and this was raised by um, the, the Jewish historian uh, of science, uh, Noah Ephron, uh, in a chapter in the book Galileo Goes to Jail, I referred to that book earlier, and he basically says uh, to Christians who want to make this argument that uh, in a, some simplistic way, uh, Christianity birthed modern science, be careful what you wish for, because not everything that science has produced is necessarily good. And I showed you the picture of the Trinity test at Los Alamos and, and the atomic bomb. So I think uh, perhaps it's best for Christians to maintain an arm's length relationship with that, that kind of argument. It's absolutely true that uh, science emerges in Christian Europe. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the ideas that are going into uh, Europe at that time to create the necessary kind of synergies come from outside. They come from uh, the Islamic world, uh, the, uh, the very, very important uh, in Indian numerals, which give us not only uh, 10 symbols for all numbers, but also the place value system. And that's updated by an Islamic um, a mathematician who gives us the decimal point. Think of how important the decimal point is, uh, as well as the technology that comes from uh, China and the knowledge that comes from the voyage of discovery. All those things feed into it, so it's much more complex. Uh, I, just to close, um, I guess it shows that for people who are unaware that Christianity does have a part in the development of science and the progress in Europe. Um, but he probably, like you say, he goes over the top and goes too far. Yeah, and I, I think you know one of the core um, uh, ideas is that uh, it's, a, it's creation theology and the idea of, of, a, of, a, of a rational God, which gives us the idea that nature is not inscrutable. And there are some cultures where nature is inscrutable. So there are a number of sort of uh, ideas uh, that, uh, that are also uh, part of that. But it's more complex than to say that it's just, just Christianity. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your um, talk. Just right up my alley. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, the, the Greeks the early Greeks, you mentioned that they were already thinking in terms of science and of separating nature from their gods, their pantheon. And I find that very interesting, because I do wonder if the Jews and the Greeks and the Egyptians could have um, caused science to emerge before Christ came, um, had there not been this kind of um, tribalism, um, for lack of a better word, um, in Alexandria on the part, on the part of the Jews. Um, I mean, 50% of Nobel Peace Prize winners are Jewish, um, roughly. And I think it's because they have an understanding of God's laws and therefore they, they're good scientists. So yeah, kind of on the, kind of on the back of the previous question, um, there were many, uh, influences in the development of science, but to specific point, um, what do you think the role of Paul, the Apostle Paul, and his theology that he explicitly, you know, formulates in the book of Romans and so on did in the ancient world as far as taking a perspective that God is ontologically separate from his creation. And so therefore you could analyze creation and you, science could emerge. Uh, without getting into Paul, that, that general idea that you have a separation between the creator and the cre created is often cited as one of the uh, foundation uh, stones for uh, modern science. That, so to study nature is not an act of sacrilege because you're not studying, for example, God's body, which is uh, would be a theology that, that some would, would adhere to. That nature is actually real, the material world is good, it's not illusory, which you know, we have in some forms of Gnosticism, etc. Uh, the statistic on, on Jewish uh, Nobel Prize winners is something like 23 to 24% of Nobel Prizes have gone to Jews, uh, mostly in the sciences. Okay. And this is true, by the way, of this year as well. Uh, and uh, in many years, uh, it, it is true. And 
Uh, clearly, any argument that it's strictly related to Judaism doesn't work because many of those are secular Jews, but certainly it does speak to a culture that, that fosters uh, learning. Um, and uh, it's, it's remarkable. Jews are much less than uh, they're a fraction of 1% of the world's uh, population, and yet they win uh, so uh, many Nobel Prizes. It's, it's a statistic, and it, it kind of shouts out for an answer. Um, and that, that's one of the answers, is that there's this kind of culture of learning, but, but maybe deeper than that, this, this reverence for the word, which comes from not only the study of the Talmud, but also the study of the Torah. Uh, hello. Uh, first, I'd like to say I really enjoyed your speech. It was a great speech. Um, I agree with you on many of the points. Um, I, I do think that the new atheists who take science to like an extreme that goes like far beyond, like it creates like a division, right? You know, they won't actually accept that religion can be a part of science. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, do you think that many new atheists need like a formal education in theology in some way? Like maybe it should be added to like liberal arts because you seem to have this more appeal to education in the beginning of your mm -hmm. argument where you're saying how many of these people, they only have studies like Sam Harrison, neuroscientists, uh, neuroscience, um, Richard Dawkins in biology and such, and they don't really seem to actually have like any real knowledge of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they would probably change their mind, or many new atheists would change their mind if they're more educated in philosophy? Some new atheists are well educated in, in philosophy. Daniel Dennett is, a, is himself a philosopher, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, uh, Sam Harris is, as you say, a neuroscientist. They all have their areas of specialization. Um, uh, but certainly Dawkins, uh, geneticists, and, you know, renowned, and rightly so, uh, for his work in that field. Uh, but the problem is, is that when he steps outside of his tradition, even when he steps outside of his tradition, but he remains in the sciences. So, for example, when he deals with physics, uh, he works, he has to work at a very low level. And when he's dealing with theology, he seems to be working at maybe a grade eight level. Now, one of the arguments is that if you are dealing with popular culture, you have to kind of dumb down your, your rhetoric and, 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 um, and the information that you present. And that, that, that actually is partly valid. Uh, but there is also this, this, this claim that uh, you don't need to study Christianity because you already know it's wrong. So I think, I think education is uh, part of it. I think it, it works both ways. I think uh, Christians need to... Uh, educate themselves in certain areas. Uh, and so, for example, uh, to understand that atheism should not be painted with the same brush, that there are, as I said, moderate atheists who actually would agree with virtually, if not everything, uh, that I've said. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of, and this is what I'm kind of suggesting in this moment of reflection, that uh, the kind of um, ridiculous and petty language that the new atheists often use, calling religious people faith heads, for example, um, Let's face it. I mean, it happens on the other side too. Christians use that that kind of um, that kind of uh, rhetoric, and it doesn't really help uh, foster an, an intelligent conversation. These are very difficult and very profound issues, and they don't they don't have uh, simple answers. And unfortunately, uh, one of the things that the New Atheist Movement has done is is it lowered the level of the rhetoric, and uh, and and we end up dealing with these kind of silly, unnuanced uh, sound bites. But fortunately, as I said, there is also a lot of literature that has been coming out, and still is coming out, uh, which is taking this level, the argument, back up to a higher level. Do we have time for one more? One last question. One more. How would you counsel a high school student okay, who uh, uh, is told that evolution is a fact when this student believes it, it is a theory, but it is not a fact. So how would you counsel that student to respond to that teacher? Well, let me stand back from that question a little bit and, and make it more general. I think one of the, the, the problems that, that Christian young people often face is uh, that they're told, for example, it's young earth creationism or atheism. They go to uh, high school or they go to a first year university and they, they take courses in biology and they encounter very serious and very compelling science and they remember what perhaps their pastor has said, you've got this choice, which by the way is the same choice that's offered by the new atheists, right? Atheism or this kind of, you know, uh, fundamentalistic uh, form of Christianity. And that really speaks to what I referred to earlier, the excluded middle, right? That you can have 
both. You can have a committed Christian faith and you can also be committed to, uh, to, to real science. So I think, in a way, uh, the new atheists and some more fundamentalistic uh, Christians are kind of uh, singing from the, the same uh, hymn, hymn sheet. And I think, uh, hymn sheet. And I think it's important that uh, the, the spectrum of opinion on these things uh, be, uh, be better known so that people realize that uh, it's not a choice between those two things, a very restricted sort of fundamentalistic, literalistic uh, interpretation of the Bible or atheism, right? That, that there actually is something in the middle. Thanks very much for your presentation. You gave us a good insight into new atheism and uh, many of its features. So let's thank Dr. Snubbelin.